In this presentation, we will give commentary and insights on 2 Nephi chapters 1 through 2. This will not be so bad with only two chapters. These last of past weeks have been pretty long. So let's take first a look at 2 Nephi chapter 1. Here's an introduction. 2 Nephi is one of the greatest doctrinal books in the canon of Scripture. No book within the covers of the Bible and few within the Book of Mormon can rival it for breadth or purity of doctrine. Excepting only the first and the fifth chapters of this book is it without storyline. Only the Book of Moroni has less to say about the people or culture that called forth its inspired declarations, and no book of Scripture contains more by way of prophecy relative to the last days than Second Nephi. If a single theme is to be ascribed to this book, it is, as with the Book of Mormon itself, the testimony that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, and that salvation comes only through its mer His merits, mercy, and grace. Within its pages, Lehi testifies that redemption can come only in and through the Holy Messiah, who will offer himself as a sacrifice for sin, thus answering the ends of the law. Jacob affirms that this Messiah will be called Christ, and, he, and that save he should come, all men must perish. Nephi bears witness that there can be only one Messiah, there can be one Messiah only, that his name will be Jesus Christ, and that only through him may we receive a remission of sins. All who read the book are invited to believe in Christ. Lehi's discourse on the creation of the earth and the fall of Adam are without peer in scriptural writ, as is Jacob's inscription of our condition, had no atonement been made. There are no more favored passages of scripture among Latter-day Saints than Lehi's statement that Adam fell that men might be, and Jacob's statement that death hath passed upon all men to fulfill the merciful plan of the great Creator. Second Nephi synthesizes our understanding of the doctrines of the creation, the fall, and the atonement. Doctrines of such importance that Elder Bruce R. McConkie called them the three pillars of eternity. Though the Bible has preserved for us the stories of the creation, the fall, and the atonement, we turn to the Book of Mormon for an understanding of the divine purpose behind these transcendent historical events. It could be said that the Bible tells us what happened. The Book of Mormon tells us why it happened. As we speak in superlatives of this marvelous book, we must add to the list its treatment of the scattering and gathering of Israel, chapters 3, 6, 9, 10, 25, and 30, along with the Isaiah chapters 12 through 24, shed much by way of prophetic prophet prophetic insight on this doctrine of singular import. From these chapters, we learn that Joseph Smith was known to those of dispensations past as the great prophet of the Restoration, chapter 3, and that the lost sheep of Israel must be restored to a knowledge of their Redeemer and return to his fold or church and obtain the promise of lands of inheritance. Dramatizing that the purpose of the Book of Mormon are the same, the pro dramatizing that the purpose of the Bible and the Book of Mormon are the same, Nephi calls upon the testimony of Isaiah as a second witness, particularly to the doctrines of the divine sonship of Christ and the ultimate restoration of Israel. Second Nephi chapters twelve through fourteen are the brass plates version of Isaiah chapters two through fourteen. As such, they, they are the oldest and purest translation of this portion of Isaiah known to us. The subsequent chapters contain inspired commentary on the Isaiah chapters. This actually should be... Chapters through... Second Nephi chapters 2 to 14 are the same as Isaiah chapters 
No, that's not right. It's Isaiah, it's Nephi chapters. Twenty four, so this would be twenty, I believe. Chapters twenty through twenty four. Sorry, I, I got that mixed up. The scriptures contain relatively few systematic treatises of gospel principles. For the most part, our scriptural understanding comes by piercing various scriptural texts piecing various scriptural texts together. This makes 2 Nephi 31, in which Nephi's discourse on baptism and the necessity of Christ's baptism are the more valuable. This is particularly so when it is realized that the principles Nephi establishes are equally true of all other gospel ordinances. Thus we have in 2 Nephi the finest discourse in all of scripture on the necessity of gospel ordinances. Nephi seals the concluding chapters with one of the most powerful witnesses of Christ ever penned. His testimony embraces the idea that all who truly accept Jesus as the Christ will accept the Book of Mormon and its witness of him. That's how you can tell if someone really believes in Jesus Christ, because only those who really have a witness of Jesus Christ will also accept the Book of Mormon. The true Christian Nephi the, new, the true Christian Nephi would reason will accept the words of Christ, whether spoken in the new world or in the old. These words, he testified, would be sufficient to condemn the unbeliever at the day of judgment. We have no better evidence that Joseph Smith was a prophet than the doctrines he taught and no better illustration than Second Nephi. Standing alone, this book is more than sufficient to justify the testimony that we have been commissioned to bear among every nation, kindred, tongue, and people of the restoration of the gospel and the divine mission of the prophet Joseph Smith. So with that, let's take a look at 2 Nephi chapter 1. Chapter 1 verse 4, the phrase, Jerusalem is destroyed meaning the fulfillment of Lehi's prophecy relative to the destruction of Jerusalem was confirmed by vision. How like the principle that it takes the Spirit to understand the things of the Spirit, revelation to understand revelation, scripture to understand scripture, godliness to understand God. Chapter 1, verse 5, the phrase, The Lord hath covenanted this land unto me and to my children forever that the covenants of the Lord are eternal and the promise that the meek shall inherit the earth is understood by the Latter-day Saints to be literal. On this matter, Elder Orson Pratt observed, quote, different portions of the earth have been pointed out by the Almighty from time to time to his children as their everlasting inheritance. As instances, Abraham and his posterity that were worthy were promised Palestine. Moab and Ammon, the children of righteous Lot, were promised a portion not far from the boundaries of the twelve tribes. The meek among the Jaredites, together with the remnant of the tribe of Joseph, were promised the great western continent. The righteous of all nations, who shall in this dispensation be gathered to that land, will receive their inheritance in common with the meek who formerly sojourn upon the land. In the resurrection, the meek of all ages and nations will be restored to that portion of the earth previously promised to them. And thus all the different portions of the earth have been and will be disposed of to the lawful heirs, while those who cannot prove their heirship to be legal or who cannot prove that they have received any portion of the earth by promise will be cast out into some other kingdom or world. End of quote. The phrase, all those let out of their countries by the hand of the Lord, meaning, as the foundations of the restored gospel are laid, those with believing blood, those of Israel who have been restored to the faith of their ancient fathers, gathered under the direction of Joseph Smith and his successors, who hold the keys of the gathering of Israel. 
They established the kingdom of God in the western part of the United States, whence the message of salvation will be taken to the ends of the earth. Chapter 1, verse 6, the phrase, None come into this land, so they shall be brought by the Lord, means it would be hard to suppose that this statement applies to each individual that has come from the old world to the new. It apparently refers to groups, not individuals. We know that the Jaredites, the Nephites, and the Mulekites were all, were all brought to this land by the hand of the Lord, notwithstanding the fact that some of their number were unworthy of an inheritance in this promised land. More recent history affords pilgrims and Puritans as illustrations. Of such, the Lord approved in the collective sense, but certainly not in the individual sense in all cases. The context of this phrase seems to sustain that conclusion. The preceding verse speaks of those led out of other countries by the hand of the Lord. The verse that follows states that the land was consecrated to those the Lord would bring. This does not appear to be inclusive. Rather, it suggests a selection or choosing on the Lord's part as to those who will be his covenant people. Chapter 1, verses 7 through a land, the phrase, a land of liberty. President Ezra Taft Benson testified that America is a land of liberty, set apart for the restoration of the gospel. Quote, Our Father in heaven planned the coming forth of the founding fathers and their form of government as the necessary great prologue leading to the restoration of the gospel. Recall what our, our Savior Jesus Christ said nearly 2,000 years ago when he visited this promised land. Quoting the Savior, For it is wisdom in the Father that they should be established in this land and be set up as a free people by the power of the Father, that these things might come forth. End of Jesus' quote. America, the land of liberty, was to be the Lord's latter-day base of operation for his restored church. End of President Benson's quote. Elder Eduardo Il I, 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 Allah of the seven explained that the blessings of the gospel are now available wherever faithful members live. Quote, the conditions of people and of nations change due to progress in the world. Nevertheless, in many such places, be it in the frosty mountain heights, in the warm valleys, at the river's edge, or in desert places, wherever members of our church are found, there will always be those who live the basic principles, and by so doing, they bless the rest of the people. End of quote. Chapter 1, verse 7, the phrase, if it so be, means prophecy is of two kinds, conditional and unconditional. Unconditional prophecies are divine proclamations of that which will be irrespective of what men or nations do. The first and second coming of Christ, resurrection, the day of judgment are classic examples of unconditional prophecy. Conditional prophecies are prophecies, assurances, or warnings of what will or will not be dependent upon the obedience or disobedience of those whom the prophecy is given. The promise of liberty to the inhabitants of the American continent was obviously conditional. The phrase, unto the righteous it shall be blessed forever, means those desiring the protection of heaven must clothe themselves in the robes of righteousness. Where they are, the protecting hand of the Lord will be also. To those of our day, the Lord has said, Arise and shine forth, that thy light might be standard for the nations, that from the gathering together upon the land of Zion and upon her stakes may be for a defense and for a refuge from the storm and from the wrath, whether it be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. Chapter 1, verse 8, the phrase, this land kept from the knowledge of other nations, means Columbus's courageous discoverer of America at the close of the 15th century has compelled the generous and just admiration of the world. 
The reader of the Book of Mormon is aware that Columbus was directed in his enterprise by the Spirit of God, as he himself attested, as Columbus was destined in the providence of God to establish the union between the old and new worlds, others by that same providence were prohibited from doing so or from making known that they had done so. The heavens have their timetable, and it is not for man to hurry the season of harvest. Had the knowledge of the Americas been made known even a century earlier, the religion transplanted to the Western world would have been that of the Church of Europe at its lowest stage of decadence. The period closing with the 15th century was that of the dense darkness that goes before the dawn. Nephi gave a prophetic description of the status of Christianity in that day and the dominance of a great and abominable church which is obsession with its obsession for gold, silver, silk, scarlets, fine twine linen, precious clothing, and harlots. Indeed, it was to escape the chain of bondage and darkness of religious oppression that the people of spiritual nobility immigrated to the new land. Chapter 1, verse 9, They may possess this land unto themselves. The lack of obedience on the part of Lehi's children resulted in their becoming a shared rather than an exclusive birthright to the promised land. Chapter 1, verse 10, the phrase, knowledge of the creation of the earth, meaning this was contained on the brass plates. We have no indication in that portion of the Book of Mormon, which we presently have, that the Nephites received an independent revelation on the matter. To have a revealed account of the story of the creation, as we have of the latter days in the Book of Moses, and to accept it in faith is the source of spiritual power. The phrase power to do all things by faith means anciently it was understood that those who held the priesthood should have power by faith to break mountains, to buy the seas, to dry up waters, to turn them out of their course, to put at defiance the armies of nations, to divide the earth, to break every hand, to stand in the presence of God, to do all things according to his will, according to his command, subdue principalities and powers, and this by the will of the Son of God, which was from before the foundation of the world. This statement, restored to us in the Joseph Smith translation, was undoubtedly in the brass plates. The phrase, having all the commandments from the beginning, means the doctrines and ordinance of salvation do not vary from one just dispensation to the next. To know the principles of salvation in one day and age is to know them in all others. The Nephites enjoyed the fullness of the gospel, as had the righteous in the days of Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and other great prophets. The gospel of Jesus Christ is same no matter when it is ever restored at any time on this earth. The ordinances and covenants will always be the same. Chapter 1, verse 11, the phrase, He will bring other nations unto them, means Bible history established the pattern. The Lord constantly placed in the hands of foreign nations the rod with which he chastened rebellious Israel. All covenants with the Lord center in righteousness. The assurance of divine protection and the granting of lands of promise are always predicated upon righteousness. The phrase scattered and smitten, meaning this is a prominent Book of Mormon theme. In faith and obedience, Israel is gathered and blessed. In rebellion and disobedience, Israel is scattered and scourged. Chapter 1, verses 13 through 23, Awake from the sleep of hell, that phrase meaning disobedience to the Lord's commandments, allows Satan to deceive us and we forget the light and truth we have previously learned. Isn't that interesting? If we leave God, we not only don't gain any more light and truth, but we lose previous light and truth. President Henry B. Iron of the First Presidency described this dangerous condition, quote, One of the effects of disobeying God seems to be the creation of just enough spiritual anesthetic to block 
any sensation as the ties of God are being cut. Not only does the testimony of the truth slowly erode, but even the memories of what it was like to be in the light begin to seem like a delusion. End of quote. Chapter 1, verse 13, the phrase, the sleep of hell, means Satan rejoices in the spirits that sleep, for the sleeping soul cannot march in the army of the Lord. Indifference is the arch enemy of all good causes. Chapter 1, verse 14, with great energy of soul, Lehi exhorted his family in the paths of everlasting life. His example ought to be imitated by every father and mother. Chapter 1, verse 15, the phrase, the Lord hath redeemed my soul from hell, means, having served God faithfully all his days, Lehi, now in the waning moments of his life, confidently declared himself redeemed from hell. That is, through his faithfulness, he became free from the blood and sins of this generation. His salvation was assured. The phrase, I have beheld his glory, means Lehi was a perfect witness of Christ, having seen and experienced his glory. Chapter 1, verse 19, a favored people of the Lord, he, is, he that is righteous is favored of God. Notice that God does have favored people, but notice that everybody can be favored if they want. As long as you're righteous, then anyone is favored of God. Chapter 1, verse 21, the phrase, be men, meaning that is, be men of Christ. The phrase, be determined in one mind and in one heart, means salvation consists of our learning to think as Christ thinks, believe as he believes, feel as he feels, and do as he would do. Thus, in Paul's language, we obtain the mind of Christ. For as the Lord said to those of our dispensation, if ye are not one, ye are not mine. Chapter 1, verse 22, the eternal destruction of both soul and body. This expression does not have reference to the annihilation of the body and spirit of the wicked. Such an interpretation would contradict many passages of Scripture the better part of which have been spoken by Nephite prophets. The Book of Mormon is most emphatic that the resurrection is universal and that it consists of the inseparable union of, both, of body and spirit. The body and soul could properly be thought of as being destroyed in the sense that, that they come forth in some resurrection other than the first or celestial resurrection. Such was Lehi's meaning in this instance. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained the meaning of the destruction of the soul as Nephi used it. Quote, destruction does not mean annihilation. We know because we are taught in the revelations that the Lord, that a soul cannot be destroyed. Every soul born into this world shall receive the resurrection and immortality and shall endure forever. Destruction does not mean then annihilation. When the Lord says they shall be destroyed, he means they shall be banished from his presence, that they shall be cut off from the presence of light and truth, and shall not have the privilege of gaining this, this exaltation, and that is destruction. Chapter 1, verse 23, the phrase, Come forth out of obscurity. With this phrase, Lehi invited his wayward sons to abandon those places in which they sought to hide, as it were, from the responsibilities of full citizenship in the church and kingdom of God. Chapter 1, verse 24, the phrase, whose views have been glorious, means, having sought for and received a knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom, Nephi was as an oasis of wisdom and inspired counsel in the arid desert of his brother's rebellion. Chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. It is common among men to confess the mess to confuse the message with the messenger. Those on the Lord's errand have no right to say anything save that which the Lord directs, nor is it for mortals to edit God. 
No teacher of the gospel has the right to add to the commandments or take away from their number or message. We are to give as the Lord directs to us to give and withhold as the Lord directs us to withhold. We are to teach with compassion, reproving betimes with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and then showing forth afterwards an increase of to Lord's increase of love towards him whom thou hast reproved, lest he esteem thee to be his enemy. Chapter 1, verse 26, the phrase, That which ye call anger was the truth. Concerning who decides what is true, Elder Richard G. Scott said, quote, Please understand that no one can change truth. Rationalization, overpowering self-interest, all of the arguments of men, anger or self-will, cannot change truth. Satan knows that, so he tries to create an atmosphere where one unwittingly begins to feel that he can not only choose what to do, but he can determine what is right to do. Satan strives to persuade us to live outside truth by rationalizing our actions as the right of choice. But our eternal Father defined truth and, and established what is right and wrong before the creation of the world. He also fixed the consequences of obedience and of disobedience to those truths. He defended our right to choose our path in life so that we would grow, develop, and be happy. But we do not have the right to choose the consequences of our acts. Please understand. No one has the privilege to choose what is right. God received that prerogative to himself, or reserved that prerogative to himself. Our agency does allow us to choose among alternate paths, but then we are bound to the consequences God has decreed. Later, if we don't like where the path takes us, the only out is through repentance. End of quote. Chapter 1, verse 31, Thy seed shall be blessed with his seed. Matthew taught the principle thus, He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. A prophet's reward is exaltation and eternal life. And so as we receive the prophets and obey them, to the best of our ability, we can receive what they receive. Let's now turn to 2 Nephi chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 2, He shall consecrate thine afflictions for thy gain, meaning it is in our extremities that we become acquainted with God, which is life's greatest blessing. The soul of the righteous is sanctified through suffering. To a lamenting Joseph Smith, then incarcerated in the Liberty Prison, the Lord granted the assurance, All these things shall give thee experience, and shall be for thy good. Brothers and sisters, mortality was meant to be a suffering. Suffering is a great part of mortality that we must come to accept and learn how to endure. Dallin, Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained how a sense of gratitude enables us to see our hardships in the context of our purpose here on earth. Quote, when we give thanks in all things, we see hardship and adversity in the context of the purpose of life. We are sent here to be tested. There must be opposition in all things. We are meant to learn and to grow through that opposition, through meeting our challenges, and through teaching others to do the same. End of quote. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that God provides us with challenges that are designed to help us grow spiritually. Quote, Just when all seems to be going right, challenges often come in multiple doses applied sim simultaneously. When those trials are not consequences of your disobedience, they are evidence that the Lord feels you are prepared to grow more. He therefore gives you experiences that stimulate growth, understanding, and compassion, which polishes you for your everlasting benefit. 
to get you from where you are to where he wants you to be requires a lot of stretching, and that generally entails discomfort and pain. End of quote. Chapter 2, verse 3, the phrase, Thou art redeemed. In other words, your spouse salvation is sure through both your righteousness and merits of the great mediator. The phrase, the fullness of time, meaning the expression used here has reference to the day of Christ's mortal ministry, usually designated as the meridian of time. Using the same expression as Nephi, Paul wrote, When the fullness of the time of, was come, God sent forth his Son, made of woman, made under the law, man, I'm sorry, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Paul also spoke of the dispensation of the fullness of times as the day in which we live, the day in which all things are to be restored. Those living before Christ's earthly ministry properly see his coming as a time of fullness or a time of completion, not only of the law of Moses, but also of thousands of messianic prophecies. In the revelations of the restoration, the phrase is used to identify our dispensation as the fullness of all past dispensations. The priesthood keys, powers, and authorities of all past dispensations can be likened to rivers emptying into the ocean of fullness in which we live. Chapter 2, verse 4. The Spirit is the same yesterday, today, and forever. To know how the Spirit of the Lord operates in one dispensation is to know how it operates in all dispensations. The operations of the Spirit are forever the same. The phrase salvation is free means unconditional or general salvation, that which comes by grace alone without obedience to gospel law, consists in the mere fact of being resurrected. In this sense, salvation is synonymous with immortality. It is the inseparable connection of body and spirit so that the resurrected personage lives forever. Conditional or individual salvation, that which comes by grace coupled with gospel obedience, consists in receiving an inheritance in the celestial kingdom of God. This kind of salvation follows faith, repentance, baptism, receipt of the Holy Ghost, and continued righteousness to the end of one's mortal probation. Through the atonement of Jesus Christ, the plan of salvation is freely available to everyone. This does not mean that all men and women will receive the same reward. As Alma testified, whosoever will come may come and partake of the waters of life freely. But he added this warning, whosoever will not come, the same is not compelled to come. But in the last day it shall be restored unto him according to his deeds. Salvation is free in the sense that it is provided by the grace of God through the atonement of Christ for all who will receive it. It is not free in the sense that it is given to all regardless of what they believe and how they choose to live their lives. Chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. No doctrine has been more confused by modern Christianity than that salvation by grace. The popular Christian doctrine in which the grace of Christ is made to appear the summum bonum of the whole matter of salvation, ignoring all other principles of the gospel, is dependent on an extremely selective reading of verses from the epistles of Paul. The position is such a distortion of truth that even Christ cannot be quoted to sustain it. To our everlasting blessing, the Book of Mormon teaches the doctrine of salvation by grace in plainness and clarity. In the instance of this chapter, Lehi's discourses with Lehi discourses with marvelous power on the matters of obedience to the law and of the saving grace of Christ. Chapter 2, verse 5, men are instructed sufficiently that they may know good from evil. That phrase means, this is because of the light of Christ, which is given to all men when they are born into mortality. 
The phrase, by the law no flesh is justified, means obedience to the laws, be it the law of Moses or the fullness of the gospel law, will not resurrect or exalt a man. Had there been no atoning sacrifice, there would be no resurrection, no eternal life, no celestial kingdom, no saved beings. Only in that which Christ did for us, that which he could that which we could not do for ourselves is the hope of salvation granted to men. Some have falsely supposed that salvation comes by obedience to divine law alone, and that God is God by virtue of his knowledge of eternal laws, coupled with his ability to live in harmony with them. Were this the case, law would be our God. No atoning sacrifice, no redeemer, would have been necessary. Such a doctrine makes a god of divine engineer, a master scientist who, having discovered eternal law, now conforms his every action to it. In fact, law is the servant of God, not his master or co-partner. God is the giver of the law, the author and maker of it. Such is the testimony of all scripture. Such was the doctrine of the prophet Joseph Smith. Chapter 2, verses 6 through 30, Creation, Fall, and the Atonement. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, shared the following insights about the interrelationship between the creation, the fall, and the atonement. Quote, It is not possible to believe in Christ and his atoning sacrifice in the true and full sense required to gain salvation without at the same time believing and accepting the true doctrine of the fall. If there had been no fall, there would have been no need for a Redeemer or Savior. And it is not possible to believe in a fall out of which immortality and eternal life comes without at the same time believing and accepting the true doctrine of the creation. If there had been no creation of all things in the deathless or immortal state, there can have been no fall, and hence no atonement or no salvation. The Father's eternal plan called for the creation, for the fall, and for the atonement, all woven together into one united whole. End of quote. On another occasion, Elder Bruce R. McCockey explained, quote, The most important events that ever have or will occur in all eternity are the creation, the fall, and the atonement. Before we can even begin to understand the temporal creation of all things, we must know how and in what manner these things, these three eternal verities, the creation, the fall, and the atonement, are inseparably woven together to form one plan of salvation. No one of them stands alone. Each of them ties into the other two. And without a knowledge of all them, it is not possible to know the truth about any one of them. But, be it remembered, the atonement came because of the fall. Christ paid the ransom for Adam's transgression. If there had been no fall, there would be no atonement, with its consequent consequent immortality and eternal life. Thus, justly as surely as salvation comes because of the atonement, so also salvation comes because of the fall. End of quote. Chapter 2, verse verse 6, by the law, no flesh is justified, meaning, rarely has even the inspired pen been more eloquent. Redemption cometh in and through the the holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. Redemption wrought by Christ is not a matter of grace alone, but rather is found in grace and truth. Surely there is no salvation to be found in error or falsehood or in declarations of praise to some image of Christ that exists only in the minds of men. Without truth there is no salvation. Grace is efficacious only in the midst of truth. We cannot be justified by the law because we cannot live the law perfectly. To be justified by the law is we'd have to live the gospel perfectly. There's only one person who did that, and that was Jesus Christ. And that is why he was not bound under the law, because he lived it perfectly. Therefore, 
he was above the law and could redeem us from our sinning the parts of the law that we sin because we're mortal. Elder Donald H. Oaks instructed us that the Book of Mormon teaches that, quote, salvation cometh not by keeping the commandments alone, but the law, by the law, no flesh is justified. Even those who serve God with their whole souls are unprofitable servants. Man cannot earn his own salvation. The Book of Mormon teaches since man had fallen, he could not merit anything of himself. There can be nothing which is short of an eternal atonement which will suffice for the sins of the world. Wherefore, redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah. He offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law. And so we preach of Christ that our children may know that to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. End of quote. Since Christ lived the law of perfectly, he answered all of the law. And therefore, he can redeem us from our sinning the law through repentance, which is granted to us by his grace and truth. Chapter, seven, uh, chapter 2, verse 7, the phrase, unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit means, Salvation is not promised to those glib of tongue, but rather to those with a back bent by the burdens of the kingdom. As there is no salvation without truth, so there is no salvation without obedience, without a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Chapter 2, verse 8, the phrase merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah means obedience, righteousness, acceptance of truth, all are essential to salvation. Yet with them, all we have, all we have nothing save it be for the merit, mercy, and grace of Christ. As there is no other name by which man can be saved, so there is no other way than through a total reliance upon that which Christ did for us, that which we could not have done for ourselves. We have to rely completely on his merits, his mercy, and his grace. All our obedience is nothing without that. Prior to his call as the quorum of the, of the 70, Elder Bruce C. Hafen explained that the atonement is not simply God's method for right, righting wrongs and satisfying the demands of justice, the atonement is rehabilitative, a miraculous power that can help us change who we are. Quote, I once wondered if those who refuse to repent, but who then satisfy the law of justice by paying for their own sins, are then worthy to enter the celestial kingdom. The answer is no. The entrance requirements for celestial life are simply higher than just merely satisfying the law of justice. For that reason, paying for our sins will not bear the same fruit as repenting of our sins. Justice is a law of balance and order, and it must be satisfied either through our payment or his, meaning Christ. But if we decline the Savior's invitation to let him carry our sins and then satisfy justice by ourselves, we will not yet have experienced the complete rehabilitation that can occur through a combination of divine assistance and genuine repentance. Working together, those factors have the power permanently to change our heart and our lives, preparing us for celestial life. End of quote. Elder Richard G. Scott shared his feelings about Christ's merciful mercy in paying our debts. Quote, Jesus Christ possessed merits that no other child of Heavenly Father could possibly have. He was a God, Jehovah, before his birth in Bethlehem. His Father not only gave him his spirit body, but Jesus was his only begotten Son in the flesh. Our master lived a perfect sinless life and therefore was free from the demands of justice. He was and is perfect in every attribute, including love, compassion, patience, obedience, forgiveness, and humility. His mercy pays our debt to justice. 
when we repent and obey him. End of quote. Second Nephi chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 9, the first few, the first fruits, meaning the Mosaic Code required the Israelites to consecrate the first fruits of their harvest to God. These were to be brought to the temple and given to the priests for their support. Thus the Lord's people are spoken of as the first fruits, meaning those dedicated to him and his service. In a more specific sense, as in the present verse, Christ is spoken as the first fruits, thus conveying the idea that the fruit or labors of his life were fully consecrated to his Father. Chapter 2, verse 10, the phrase, because of the intercession for all, means man did not create himself, nor is he the master of his destiny. Both creation and destiny rest in the hands of God. He alone is the author of the plan by which salvation or damnation is granted to men. It is out of that plan which called for the fall and the subsequent atonement that the doctrine of advocacy advocacy, intercession, or mediation grows. In his atoning sacrifice, Christ paid the penalty for the sins of all men on condition of repentance, so that all might escape the judgment decreed for disobedience. As taught by Abinadi, this law is that God gave the Son power to make intercession for the children of men, and that thereby redeemed them and satisfied the demands of justice. For those whom no intercession is made, Abinadi taught, are damned, for they have sought their own carnal will, refused the Lord, and remained unrepentant. Lehi's testimony that Christ made intercession for all is in harmony with the testimony of Paul who taught there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Christ alone is our mediator, intercessor, and advocate with the Father. To seek others as mediators between ourselves and God is to deny Christ's role as Redeemer and Savior. Chapter 2, verse 11, the phrase, opposition in all things, means no virtue can exist without its corresponding evil. Without the evil of danger, there could be no courage. Without suffering, there could be no sympathy. Without poverty, there could be no generosity, and so forth. Without darkness, there could be no light. Without cold, there could be no hot. Without depths, there could be no heights. There, thus, there must be wickedness, so that there must might be righteousness. Death, so there might be life. And that which is satanic, so that there might be that which is godly. Where there, where, where there no opposites, all things must remain a compound in one. Can you imagine that? Imagine a world in which all things were the same color, were all same size and had the same functions, a world in which one could neither have nor be without, a world which neither sound nor silence, a world in which there was no beauty or lack of it, a world without love or hate, the sweet or sour, virtue or vice. In other words, it would be a world of nothingness and sameness, at the same time, which is incomprehensible, it would be a world of a big mess. That's what it means to be a compound in one. President Boy K. Packer, president of the Corner of the Twelve Apostles, explained that opposition helps us grow stronger. Quote, life will not be free from challenges, some of them bitter and hard to bear. We may wish to be spared all the trials of life, but that would be contrary to the great plan of happiness, for it must needs be that there is no that there is an opposition in all things. This testing is the source of our strength. End of quote. See, to have a great plan of happiness, you must also have a great plan where there is sorrow and suffering. To know one, to know the other. 
President Ezra Taft Benson explained that opposition provides choice. Quote, the Book of Mormon teaches that it must needs be that there is opposition in all things, and so there is. Opposition provides choices, and choices bring consequences, good or bad. The Book of Mormon explains that men are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. God loves us, the devil hates us. God wants us to have a fullness of joy as he has. The devil wants us to be miserable as he is. God gives us commandments to bless us. The devil would have us break these commandments to curse us. Daily, constantly, we choose our destiny. I'm sorry, we choose our desires, our thoughts, and our actions, whether we want to be happy or cursed, happy or miserable. End of quote. Elder Neal I. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, commented on how opposition relates to happiness. Quote, Indeed, without the existence of choices, without our freedom to choose, and without opposition, there would be no real existence. This is so much like Leif High's metaphor of how, in the absence of agency and opposites, things would have resulted in a meaningless, undifferentiated compound in one. In such a situation, the earth would actually have no purpose in the end of its creation. It is a fact that we can neither grow spiritually nor thereby be truly happy unless and until we make wise use of our moral agency. End of quote. Chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. It is the existence of opposites coupled with the agency of man that gives meaning and purpose to our moral, moral probation. Laws are essential to the purposeful life, as is clear distinction between good and, as is a clear distinction between good and evil. Any therapy that purports to free men from the burden of sin by denying the existence of sin also denies to its adherents that joy and peace can only be known by obedience to the laws of God. Any religious system in which a profession of faith is accepted as a substitute for true repentance denies its practitioners not only relief from the burden of sin, but also the very knowledge of how one obtains God's favor and progress in the direction of the divine presence. Chapter 2, verse 14, the phrase, God created all things, both the heavens and the earth. The knowledge and power of God are not limited to earthly things. Indeed, he is the creator of all things, both in heaven and the earth, and has complete knowledge of and power over them. Let me repeat that. He has complete knowledge of and power over all of them. God knows all. He could not be God if he did not have all knowledge. The phrase things to act and things to be acted upon means the living and the dead, the animate and inanimate, all are subject to the mind and will of God. Thus Nephi stated, if God had commanded me to do all things, I could do them. If he should command me that I should say unto this water, be thou earth, it should be earth. If, if I should say it, it would be done. Chapter 2, verses 15 through 16. Perhaps no story in Scripture writ matches that of Eden in its symbolic richness. In the midst of the Garden of Eden was the Tree of Life, a symbolic representation of Christ and immortality. Standing opposite the Tree of Life was the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. Each tree bore its distinctive fruit, the fruit of eternal life or of endless death, the one being sweet, the other bitter. Thus Adam and Eve could exercise agency, having a choice of which fruit they would partake. Had there been nothing within the garden that was forbidden to Adam and Eve, had there been no opposition, there could be neither agency nor progress available to them. That's why there had to be a tree of knowledge in good and evil and why they had to partake of it, and that that was part of the plan. 
Chapter 2, verse 15, our first parents. Adam and Eve are the mortal parents of all. There is no scriptural justification for the idea of pre-Adamites. In a revelation directed to our day, Adam was declared to be the father of all. As to the manner in which Adam was placed on the earth, the first presidency of the church, Joseph F. Smith, John R. Winder, and Anthony H. Lund, in an official statement titled, The Origin of Man, stated, quote, Adam took upon himself an appropriate body, the body of a man, and so became a living soul. All who have inhabited the earth since Adam have taken bodies and become souls in like manner. Man began life as a human being, in the likeness of our Heavenly Father. True it is that the body of man enters upon its career as a tiny germ embryo, which becomes an infant, quickened at a certain stage by the Spirit, whose tabernacle it is, and the child, after being born, develops into a man. There is nothing in this, however, to indicate that the, origin, that the original man, the first of our life, began life as anything less than a man, or less than a human germ or embryo that becomes a man. We were not an animal, a fish, or an ape before we became a man. That is a declaration from the first presidency, meaning from Jehovah himself. Brigham Young said, Though we have it in our history that our father Adam knew nothing about his God previous to being made here, yet it is not so. When we learn the truth, we will see and understand that he helped to make this world, and he was the manager of that operation. He was the person who brought the animals and the seeds from other planets to this world. Examples of Jehovah transplanting people, buildings, plants, animals, etc. from one planet to another are the following. An entire city of Enoch, the people of Enoch, was transplanted from one earth or planet to another. The people of Melchizedek were also transplanted from one planet to another. John the Beloved was tr translated so that he could go between one planet to another. And the three Nephites were likened unto the blessing that John the Beloved received and were translated beings that could go from one planet to another. The first presidency, who were Joseph S. Smith, John Winder, and Anthony H. Lundigan, stated this doctrine in 1909 in the following words, quote, all men and women are in the similitude of the universal father and mother and are literally the sons and daughters of deity, not of some other essence, of glob of something in earth that later became a fish and then became an ape. That is not true. We are literal sons and daughters of deity. President Spencer W. Kimball said the role of women was fixed even before she was created. And God is the same yesterday and forever. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their names Adam. Mr. and Mrs. Adam, I suppose, or brother and sister Adam, in the day when they were created. This is a partnership. Then when they had created them in the image of God, to them was given the eternal command, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. And as they completed this magnificent creation, they looked it over and pronounced it good, very good, something that isn't to be improved upon by our modern intellectuals, such as the teachings and ideology of homosexuality and transvestism and that you can change and make your own gender and fluid gender and all of that. The male to till the ground, I'm now back to his quote, the male to till the ground, support the family to give proper leadership, the women to cooperate, to bear the children, and to rear and teach them. It was good, very good. The way God designed it for male and female to marry and to have children 
born as children from the beginning, was good, declared very good by God. And that's the way the Lord organized it. This wasn't an, experience, an experiment. He, meaning God, knew what he was doing. Those things that endanger a happy marriage are infidelity, slothfulness, selfishness, abortion, unwanted birth control, leaving the home to others, and sin in all of its manifestations, which would include homosexuality, lesbianism, and trans transgenderism or would all be of the devil. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, quote, The account of the creation of Genesis was not a spirit creation, but it was in a particular sense a spiritual creation. That This, of course, needs some explanation. The account in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 is the account of the creation of the physical earth. The account of placing of all life upon the earth upon and until the fall of Adam is an account in a, in a sense of the spiritual creation of all these, but it was also a physical creation. When the Lord said he created Adam, he had no reference to the creation of his spirit, for that had taken place ages and ages before when he was in the world of spirits and known as Michael. Adam's body was created from the dust of the earth, but at that time it was a spiritual earth. It wasn't a fallen earth like ours, which is celestial, but a spiritual earth, which is more terrestrial. That's my, now back to his quote. Adam had a spiritual body until mortality came upon him to the violation of law under which he was living. But he also had a physical body of flesh and bones. Notice, not of blood. A spiritual body consists of flesh and bones and the spirit running through our veins. Continuing President Smith. Now, what is a spiritual body? It is one that is quickened by the spirit and not by blood. After the fall, which came by a transgression of the law under which Adam was living, the forbidden fruit had the power to create blood and change his nature, and mortality took the place of immortality. And all things partaking of the change became mortal. Now I repeat, the account in Genesis 1 and 2 is the account of the physical creation of the earth and all upon it. But the creation was not subject to mortal law until after the fall. It was therefore a spiritual creation, and so remained until after the fall when it became temporal and mortal. End of quote. Brigham Young said, quote, Here let me state to all philosophers of every class upon the earth, when you tell me that Adam was made as we make adobes from the earth, you tell me what I deem an idle tell. When you tell me that beasts of the field were produced in that manner, you are speaking idle words devoid of meaning. There is no such thing in all the eternities where the gods dwell. Mankind are here because they the, are the offspring of parents who were first brought here from another planet. End of quote. Adam and Eve were created upon another planet, which was not fallen. It was a spiritual planet, a terrestrial planet. Quoting, now continuing Brigham Young's quote, Adam was made from the dust of an earth, but not from the dust of this earth. He was made as you and I are made, and no person was ever made upon any other principle. End of quote. Things were first created spiritually. The Father actually begat the spirits, and they were brought forth and lived with him. Then he commanded the work of creating earthly tabernacles, precisely as he had been created in this flesh himself by partaking of the coarse materials that was organized and composed this earth, until his system was charged with it. 
Consequently, the tabernacle of his children were organized from the coarse materials of this earth. So our Father and Mother in heaven, who can produce spirit children, partook of the coarse materials of this earth before its fall so that they could now create spiritual children that have spiritual bodies of flesh and bone. The Contributor Church Magazine says, And though it is said that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, it by no means follows that he was formed as one might form a brick or from the dust of this earth. We are, we are all formed of the dust of the ground, though instead of being molded as a brick, we are brought forth by the natural laws of procreation. So also was Adam and his wife in some older world. Don't tell me the church hasn't made comments about evolution and that evolution is not true. They are, how else can you say it clearer? That we did not evolve from lower forms of animal life. Joseph Fielding, President Joseph Fielding Smith said, I will tell you, life did not commence upon this earth spontaneously. Its origins was not here. Life existed long before our solar system was called into being. The fact is, there never was a time when man made in the image of God, male and female, did not exist. The Lord revealed to Joseph Smith the truth that man was also in the beginning with God. The Lord has given us the information regarding his creations and how he has made many earths. For there never was a beginning, never was a time when man did not exist somewhere in the universe. And when the time came for this earth to be peopled, the Lord our God transplanted upon it from some other earth the life which is found here. President Joseph Filling Smith again said, quote, Does it not appear to you that it is a foolish and ridiculous notion that when God created this earth, he had to begin with a speck of protoplasm and take millions of years, if not billions, to bring conditions to pass by which his sons and daughters might obtain bodies made in his image? Why not the shorter route and transplant them from another earth as we are taught in the scriptures? End of quote. So all of the plants and trees and animals and everything are transplanted from other earths to here. Genesis 2.15 says, And God, the Lord God, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to, get, to keep it. Adam was put here from another place, which God created by the means of how men and women are created. In 1925, the first presidency taught, man as a spirit was begotten and born of heavenly parents and reared to maturity in the eternal mansions of the Father prior to coming upon the earth in a temporal body to undergo an experience in mortality. Yes, the church has declared that evolution is not true. President Joseph Philly Smith again said, quote, It is true that Adam helped to form this earth. He labored with our Savior, Jesus Christ. I have a strong view or conviction that there were others who assisted them, perhaps Noah and any, and why not Joseph Smith, and those who were appointed to be rulers before the earth was formed. End of quote. Chapter 2, verse 15. The tree of knowledge of God and of good and evil and the tree of life. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the meaning of the tree of life, the knowledge, tree of knowledge of good and evil. Quote, As to the fall, the scripture set forth that there was in the Garden of Eden two trees. One was the tree of life, which figuratively refers to eternal life. The other was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which figuratively refers to how and why and in what manner mortality and all that pertains to it came into being. End of quote. 
Chapter 2, verses 15, the phrase, what was forbidden? President Joseph Fielding Smith said, showed how the Book of Mormon helps us understand why the Lord commanded Adam not to partake of the fruit. Quote, just why the Lord would say to Adam that he forbade him to partake of the fruit of the tree is not clearly made clear in the Bible account. But in the original account, as it comes to us in the Book of Mormon, it is made definitely clear. It is, the Lord said to Adam, that if he wished to remain as he was in the garden, then he was not to eat of the fruit. But if he desired to eat it and partake of death, he was at liberty to do so. End of quote. God was not using reverse psychology to try to get him to partake of the fruit. Both trees were there, and God clearly had taught Adam and Eve the whole plan of salvation while they were still in the Garden of Eden. And they knew part of that was having children. And they knew that part of having children was to partake of the tree so they could become mortal and partake of it. So all that God was saying is, if you want to stay in the garden like it is, then I command you not to partake of that tree because that's how you stay here. Because if you take of it, then you have to leave the garden. But if you want to continue the plan and have kids and have mortal bodies and become like me, then it, the tree's given to you. Then you are at liberty to partake of it. So decide which one you will want to do. There is no mystery to the fall. Adam and Eve had their choice, and they clearly understood the choices and knew what each tree meant, and they knew the plan of salvation. Chapter 2, verse 15 through 16, the phrase, man should act for himself. President Howard W. Hender taught that agency is necessary for our growth. Quote, our Father in Heaven wanted our growth to continue in mortality and to be enhanced by our freedom to choose and learn. He also wanted us to exercise our faith and our will, especially with a new physical body to master and control. But we know from both ancient and modern revelation that Satan wished to deny us our independence and agency in that now forgotten moment long ago, even as he wished to deny them this, to deny them this very hour. And these Salem, Satan violently opposed the freedom of choice offered by the Father, so violently that John the Revelator described war in heaven over the matter. Satan would have coerced us, and he would have robbed us of that most precious gift if he could, our freedom to choose a divine future and exaltation we all hope, all hope to obtain. Through Christ and his valiant defense of our Father's plan, the course of agency and eternal aspirations prevailed. So we came to our mortality like Jeremiah, known by God as his little spirit children, having the privilege to choose our personal path on matters of belief and religious conviction. With Christ's triumph in heaven and overcoming Lucifer and later's triumph on earth and overcoming the effects of Adam's fall and the death of all mankind, the children of men continue free forever, knowing good from evil, to act for themselves and not to be acted upon. To fully understand this gift of agency and its inestimable worth, it is imperative that we understand that God's chief way of acting is by persuasion and patience and long-suffering, not by coercion and stark confrontation. He acts by gentle solicitation and by sweet enticement. He always acts with unfailing respect for the freedom and independence that we possess. He wants to help us and please for the chance to assist us, but he will not do so in violation of our agency. He loves us too much to do that, and doing so would run counter to his divine character. End of quote. Christ will always honor our agency, whether that agency is choices of good or evil. Even the evil have their agency. Chapter Nephi, chapter 2, verse 17 through 18, an angel of God became a devil. 
President James E. Faust of the First Presidency explained how Lucifer fell from his position of authority. Quote, because of his rebellion, Lucifer was cast out and became Satan, the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men and to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken unto my voice. And so this personage, who was an angel of God in authority in the presence of God, was removed from the presence of God and his son. This caused great sadness in the heavens, for the heavens wept over him. He was Lucifer, a son of the morning. End of quote. Second Nephi 2.18, the phrase, and ye shall not die. Satan's lie, was Satan lying when he said that? We usually refer to Satan lying to Eve in that she would not die if she partook of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. However, in the LDS version of the scriptures for Genesis 3, 4, footnote A, it says the Hebrew for thou shall not die should read instead, in dying thou shall not die. Meaning, in physical dying, you will not permanently die because of the resurrection, but be as the gods to live eternally and thus have the potential to become like them. So what he was saying, in dying ye shall not die. They had been taught the plan. They knew the Savior would come down and redeem them. And so that's all that Satan is saying. Yes, you will die physically, but you can live again through the redemption that Christ will provide. So in dying you shall not really die if you so choose. Leave it to Satan to use scripture and to use truth for his purposes. Brigham Young stated, Along came a certain character and said to Eve, You know women are of tender heart, and he could operate on this tender heart. Quote, The Lord knows that in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt not surely die, but if thou wilt take of this fruit and eat there." Of thine eyes will be opened, and thou wilt see as the gods see. And he worked upon the tender heart of Mother Eve until she partook of the fruit, and her eyes were opened. He told the truth. He told the truth. In dying, ye shall not die. You can be resurrected through the redemption of Christ. It seems possible that what Satan was trying to do is once he got them to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and they became mortal and could now sin, he would have them immediately go partake of the tree of life and therefore they would live forever in their sins. And that would frustrate the plan of God. There would, there would have been no probationary period of repentance and living the gospel. But God stopped that, if you remember, that he put a cherubim or an angel with a flaming sword to guard the tree of life. And that stopped Adam and Eve from immediately partaking of the tree of life, uh, immortality. And so now that they'll have probation on earth, and now they could choose and live the plan of happiness if they so desired. True to form, Satan took a truth and applied it in a way that would further his purposes. Verse 18, be as gods. It is a natural desire, one born of purity and innocence, to be as God. The doctrine that salvation consists in our becoming as God has been the target of considerable bitterness in recent years. Little imagination is necessary to determine the source of that spirit which is offended by the desire of God's children to become like their eternal father. Most of tr traditional Christianity calls this an evil doctrine that we actually believe that we can become in the likeness of him who created us. But the Book of Mormon is sure that we can become as God is if we so choose to follow Christ in the Father's plan. Chapter 2, verse 19, Eden. 
The events associated with the Garden of Eden make it the archetype of our temples. Here Adam received the priesthood. Here Adam and Eve walked and talked with God. Here our first parents were eternally married by God himself. Here they learned of the tree of knowledge, the tree of good of evil, and the tree of life. Here they were taught the law of sacrifice and clothed in garments of skin. And from here they ventured into the lone and dreary world that they and their posterity might prove themselves worthy to return again to that divine presence. So here it is taught that Adam and Eve were taught about the tree of life, what it would do, what it meant, what it would cause, what the tree of knowledge of good and evil was about, what it do and what it was cause, and the gospel plan. And they were given agency to choose either one. But not both at the same time. Chapter 2, verse 21, one can hardly read the ages attributed to the ancient patriarchs without a sense of wonder. Methuselah, we are told, lived 969 years, Adam 930 years, Noah lived to be 950 years, and so on. The question is frequently asked whether the ancient year was of the same length as in our modern calendar. Lehi seems to affirm such to be the case. Their days were prolonged and their time was lengthened by the command of God, we are told. They were in a state of probation to give them time to repent if they so choose. The f phrase all men must repent, meaning the command given to Adam was that he was to do all that he did in the name of the Son and that he must repent and call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. The phrase, all men were lost, means without the liberating powers of Christ's atonement, all would be endlessly subject to the twin monsters of death and hell. Verses 22 through 26, the need for the fall. Standing alone, these verses would justify the eternal worth of the Book of Mormon. The most transcendent event in all history was the atoning sacrifice of Christ. The atonement came in answer to the fall. Without an understanding of the fall, there can be no meaningful understanding of the atonement. In turn, to understand the fall, one must understand the nature of the creation. For it is from the original state in which these in which things were created, that they have fallen, and to which, through the atonement, they are in large measure intended to return. These three principles, the creation, the fall, and the atonement, are inseparable and have properly been called the three pillars of eternity, which we have talked about previously. Within the covers of the Bible, we can read an account of the creation of Adam's fall and of the events that surrounded Christ's atoning sacrifice. Yet, it is to the Book of Mormon that we must turn to learn why things were created as they were, why it was essential to the eternal plan for salvation of man that Adam fall, and why the blood of Christ needed to be shed in an infinite sacrifice. To this end, few verses have ever been penned that are most instructive than those where written by Father Lehi. First, he told us that if Adam had not fallen, all thing, created things, that is, Adam and Eve, plants, animals, and even the earth itself, would have remained forever in the paradisiacal state in which they had been created. None would know death, none would know corruption or change of any kind, and none could produce after their own kind. All things have remained forever as they existed and complete at the completion of the created act. Let's make mention of that phrase, they could produce after their kind. Read Genesis 1 carefully, and it talks about how the trees and the, and the seeds produced after their own kind, and that the animals produced after their own kind. So the seed to become a fish could not produce a monkey. The animal produced after its own kind. Thus, you cannot have animals producing and skipping to other animals, which does away with evolution in the sense of man evoluting from the, some animal or lower form of life. Each creature and plant produce after its kind. That was the commandment God gave them. 
The book of Moses, which is the Julius Smith translation of Count of the Creation, sustains the testimony of Lehi. In it, we are told that all things were spiritual in the day in which they were created, meaning that they were not subject to death or change. The full implication of this account will be missed by those who have not understood the manner in which the scriptures use the word spiritual. For instance, Amulek defined the resurrection as a state in which the body and spirit are united, never to be divided, thus the whole becomes becoming spiritual and immortal, that they can no more see corruption. They still have physical bodies, they're just now immortal. They have flesh and bones. Thus the physical body in its resurrected or deathless state is said to be a spiritual body. This same terminology was used by Paul when he said, it is sown a natural body. He said, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and then is a spiritual body. Those without the understanding that the resurrection is the inseparable reunion of body and spirit has supposed that Paul was saying that in the world to come, we will exist only as spirits. Our own revelations are consistent with the manner in which the ancients used the word spiritual. For notwithstanding they die, they shall also rise again a spiritual body. They who are of a celestial spirit shall receive the same body which was a natural body, stated the Lord, and your glory shall be the glory by which your bodies are quickened. Thus, when the Lord describes the creation by saying that it was spiritual in the day I created it, for it remaineth in the sphere in which I, God, created it, yea, even all things which I prepared for the use of man, we understand the Lord to be saying that there was no death or corruption among God's creations. We would hardly expect God to create things in a state in which they are to die, decay, and dissolve. It was from this state in which none of God's creations were subject to death, corruption, or change that Adam fell. Further, Lehi told us that in this state no living thing could enjoy the privilege of procreation. Thus, Lehi brought us to, under, to the understanding that Adam fell to keep the great commandment of God that he and Eve have posterity. In so doing, they introduced death to all things, te both temporal and Temporal death or the separation of body and spirit and a spiritual death in that they no longer lived in the divine presence. The fall thus created the need for redemption from death and from the separation of man from God. Lehi testified that a redeemer would come in the fullness of time. Mother Eve gave a most perfect expression of the doctrine of, ball, of the fall saying, Were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed and never should have known good and evil and the joy of our redemption and the eternal life which God giveth unto all the obedient. Chapter 2, verses 22 through 23. What is the difference between sin and transgression? Elder Dallin H. Oaks explained the difference between a sin and transgression. Quote, the contrast between a sin and a transgression reminds us of the careful wording in the second article of faith. We believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgressions. It also echoes a familiar distinction in the law. Some acts like murder are crimes because they are inherently wrong. Other acts like opening without operating without a license are crimes only because they are legally prohibited. Under these distinctions, the act that produced the fall was not a sin, meaning inherently wrong, but a transgression. Wrong because it was formally prohibited, meaning that it was prohibited if Adam and Eve wanted to stay in the garden. These words are not always used to denote something different, but this distinction seems meaningful in the circumstances of the fall. End of quote. Chapter 2, verse 25, Adam fell that men might be. Elder Russell M. Nelson, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained why the fall was necessary. The creation culminated with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. 
They were in creating in the image of God with bodies of flesh and bone, creating the image of God and not yet mortal. They could not grow old and die, and they would have had no children, nor experienced the trials of life. The creation of Adam and Eve was a paradisiacal creation, one that required a significant change before they could fulfill the commandment to have children, and thus provide earthly bodies for premortal spirit sons and daughters of God. The fall of Adam and Eve constituted the mortal creation and brought about the required changes in their bodies, including the circulation of blood and other modifications as well. They were now able to have children. They and their posterity also became subject to injury, disease, and death. End of quote. Because of their transgression, Adam and Eve, having chosen to leave their state of innocence, were banished from the presence of God. This is referred to in Christendom as the fall, or Adam's transgression. It is the spiritual death because Adam and Eve were separated from the presence of God and given agency to act for themselves and not to be acted upon. They were also given the great power of procreation so they could keep the commandment to multiply and replenish the earth and have joy in their posterity. All of their posterity were likewise banished from the presence of God. However, the posterity of Adam and Eve were innocent of the original sin because they had no part in it. It was therefore unfair for all humanity to suffer eternally for transgression of our first parents, Adam and Eve. It became necessary to settle this injustice. Hence the need for the atoning sacrifice of Jesus in his role of Savior and Redeemer. Because of the transcendent, transcendent act of the atonement, it is possible for every soul to obtain forgiveness of sins, to have them washed away and, and be forgotten. This forgiveness comes about, however, on condition of repentance and personal righteousness. End of quote. President Brigham Young and President Joseph Finley Smith help, Smith help us understand that the fall was part of our Heavenly Father's plan. Did they, Adam and Eve, come out in direct opposition to God and to his government? No but they transgressed a command of the Lord, and through that transgression, sin came into the world. The Lord knew they would do this, and he had designed that they should. Adam did, not only, did only what he had to do. He partook of that fruit for one good reason. That was to open the door to bring you and me and everyone else into this world. If it hadn't been for Adam... I wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be here. We would be waiting in the heavens as spirits. End of quote. We learned from Moses 5, 10 through 11, that Adam and Eve also recognized blessings from the results of the fall. They understood the following concepts. My eyes are opened. They knew good from evil. In the flesh I shall see God. The resurrection could take place from the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should have seed. Procreation came into the world. We have known good and evil. Adam and Eve had the agency to choose between good and evil. We have known the joy of our redemption and eternal life, which God giveth unto all the obedient. The atonement could take place. Chapter 2, verse 25, that they might have joy. President Russell M. Nelson stated, The joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. End of quote. Chapter 2, verse 26, free forever. Agency is the child of the atonement. All gospel blessings and all gospel truths are appendages to the atonement. Chapter 2, verse 27, all things are given to them which are expedient. We are granted sufficient knowledge of the mysteries of heaven to save ourselves, yet not enough to negate mortality as a time and place of trial and testing. It is not expedient that we have answers to all things or that we be able to see the end from the beginning. God has given us enough truth that we can return to him in this exaltation, then we will begin to begin to gain all knowledge. So we are only given enough knowledge that is expedient. 
so there's no use in asking him things that aren't expedient to know right now. The phrase freely choose eternal life or captivity and death, meaning agency which embraces the right of choice, is fundamental to the plan of salvation. There can be no forced righteousness, for as Lehi taught us, if there is no opportunity for wickedness, there can be no opportunity for righteousness. The phrase, he seeketh that all might be miserable, means as intelligence, wisdom, truth, virtue, and light cleave unto their godly counterparts, so foolishness, carnality, and darkness cleave unto their hellish and benign companions. That which is of God exalts, that which is of Satan debases. El Duder F. Uchtdorf said the following about the importance of our free to choose, of being free to choose, quote, So the purpose of for the strength of youth is to point you to him. It teaches you eternal truths of his restored gospel, truths about who you are, who he is, and what you can accomplish with his strength. It teaches you how to make right choices based on eternal truths. It's also important to know for what for the strength of youth does not do. It doesn't make decisions for you. It doesn't give you a yes or no about every choice you might ever face. For the strength of youth focuses on the foundation for your choices. It focuses on values, principles, and doctrines instead of every specific behavior. The Lord through his prophets have always been guiding us in that direction. He is pleading with us to increase our spiritual capacity to receive revelation. He is inviting us to hear him. He is calling us to follow him in higher and holier ways. And we are learning in a similar way every week in Come, Follow Me. Joseph Smith said, I teach them correct principles and they govern themselves. Is it wrong to have rules? Of course not. We all need them every day. But it is wrong to focus only on rules instead of focusing on the Savior. You need to know the whys and the hows and then consider the consequences of your choices. You need to put your trust in Jesus Christ. He will lead you the right way. He is your strength. Important temporal and spiritual choices should not only be based on personal preference or what is convenient or popular. The Lord is not saying, do whatever you want. He is saying, let God prevail. He is saying, come, follow me. He is saying, live in a holier, higher, more mature way. He is saying, keep my commandments. Jesus Christ is our perfect example, and we strive with all our energy of soul to follow him. End of quote. Chapter 2, verse 30, days of my probation phrase, meaning mortality is a time of probation. All are expected to endure to the end. No ordinance or experience excuses one from the responsibility to live righteously and to render full obedience to the laws of God. Those having so kept his probationary state are promised that they shall have glory added upon their heads forever and ever. For those with the knowledge of the gospel, probation ends at death. For those who have not had the opportunity to hear the gospel in mortality, the days of probation continue in the world of spirits. Well, thank you for watching. Hopefully we have gained a better understanding of the plan of salvation of agency, of man, of how he was created, and our right to choose. Not that we have the right to choose what is right. We have the right to choose right things or wrong things, and that is all. And may we have the sense to choose the right things. Thank you again. And if you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.